Revelation 14, verses 4 and 5. It says, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. And no, this doesn't mean that if you get married, you're in a heap of trouble. (laughs) Or if you had the premarital problem and then later became a Christian. Women in prophecy are churches. Virgins are, of course, obedient Christians, remnant types. And, uh, And so, these that are not defiled by these false or fallen churches, for they are obedient Christians, is what... You know, if you understand prophecy, this is more or less what it's saying. So anyway, it goes on to say that these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. And we know who the Lamb is, right? It's Jesus Christ. John 129 says, um, or uh, no, yeah, 129. Uh, the Lamb of God was taken away the sin of the world, right? And John the Baptist said that when he saw Jesus coming. So it goes on, it says, These were redeemed among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no guile. I mean, these guys didn't even exaggerate or any kind of deception or whatever. Guile, that's more or less what it means. So for the, and then it says, For they were without fault before the throne of God. So our Lord, Savior, and King has a people on this earth who will follow him whithersoever he goeth. You may be one already, or you may be striving to be one, that will never bow the knee to the enemy of souls. And just to name a few areas in life that illustrate bowing to the devil, do you love to watch fictional movies, sitcoms, or read novels if, if you know it's wrong and are striving away from such things? You already bear the fruit of one who right now refuses to bow to Baal. Do you eat certain foods or consume certain drinks you know for a fact are harmful to your body, even if only in a small way, like caffeine? And by the way, the monster drinks, not only has it got caffeine in it, that logo that with the it looks like the letter M, those three things that they put together look like a letter M. Each one equals a six. I think it's in the Hebrew alphabet. It's, yeah, amen, Ralph. It's the six 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 logo. Or just the or the wave. Any kind of a wave that's hieroglyphic for six. And so they they sneak it in the logos all over the place. I mean look at the SDA logo. It's got those three waves that go around the earth. And then, of course, it's got the upside-down cross, too. So, But anyway, if you know, like even drinking stuff like that, if you know it's wrong and you, and, and you strive to keep such things far from you and your family, you again show signs of a willing heart that wants to make their father smile. Or do you lash out in anger at the drop of a hat? If not, you certainly display the James 126 bridled tongue of the obedient child of God. And there's nothing wrong with rebuking sin, but... You know, a lot of people get angry in ways that uh, are very Christ-like. Foul language, you know, pounding on people, that kind of thing. Insults, name-calling, all of it. Finger-pointing, whatever. Again, these, these are just a few areas where the enemy of souls can lure people away from the Lamb of God, which took away their sins when they accepted Him as Savior. So, I don't feel it necessary to list them all here or even trace their, you know, the sinful names in the sand, because all of us know about our own weak areas quite clearly. If, if we seek to be as his word describes, his bride will be, then we will overcome in these areas and not associate with those we know wallow in such sinfulness like this. In fact, as the passage also says here, we won't even have guile within our mouths, as I said a minute ago. And what is guile? Well, it's from the Greek word dolos. D-O-L-O-S, uh, and it actually means subtlety, deceit, craftiness, whatever, you know, or exaggeration. But uh, check this out. I'm going to read you a few verses from uh, Revelation itself. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5 says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And then Revelation 3, verse 12 says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God, and I will write upon him with my, you know, him my new name. I like the way he says this here, where uh, New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. That's at the end of a thousand years. The city will land on this planet. This planet will be the, the the residence of our God for all eternity after that day. And then, of course, Revelation 21, verse 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, 
and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. You know, the only way to be one that overcomes and is described in such words as we see here in Revelation is to truly follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. If we walk this way, then we will stand with him in New Jerusalem, just as his word promises. But first, we must stand on this earth, girded with the whole armor, ready to participate in the work of having those he sends out for us to share with, the ones that are ready to perish. I mean, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 to 13 says, We must put on the whole armor of our God, that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand, withstand uh, in the evil day, and and having done all to stand. In other words, do the best you can. And the wiles of the devil is, it's a very tricky area here, the way he does this stuff. He can use the most gentle, subtle, little, you know, sinful thing to get you off the path. It can be a TV program. It could be a commercial. It could be a logo on your clothing. That you know, you, you, it's, it's not so much the logo, even if it has the 666 in it. If you don't realize it, that's no big deal. But the thing is, are you buying the clothing because it has the logo? You know, I mean, think about it. This always you know, confused me when I was younger. And well, still, I wear gym shoes every now and then when I go for walks. And so I just buy the cheapest pair in the store. Because they last just as long as the name brand, it seems. At least, I, you know, all my friends that had the Nikes and, and all the other ones, I said, how come I'm buying shoes the same time you are? You're paying 150 bucks for those shoes. I'm paying 30 <laughs> They're buying a brand. So why, what's the reasons for it? Keep up with the Joneses? It's, you know, stuff like that. So when we follow the Lamb, we turn our backs on Baal, just as the sons of Jacob did whenever they walked into the sanctuary. That was, you know, a a very symbolic, but we do it today, too. You know, I mean, mean, if you have studied this, you know that the courtyard of the sanctuary only had one entrance, and it was on the eastern side. So to assure that all men that entered in, walking towards the Lord, had to put their backs to the sun to go in. Because in those days, every child of God knew that the lost worshipped the sun as if it was their God. And we see them doing this today, too. I mean, that same fallen angel is demanding the exact same worship. I mean, only now he does it in ways that most men are wholly unaware. He likes to hide his demonic apparitions and ritualistic doctrines in a bevy of subtle ways. This is, this is where we come in, brothers and sisters. We, we need to show those, uh, 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 those people that the Lord sends our way. We need to show them the truth as it is written so that the traditions of man and the doctrines of demons have the light of truth cast upon them. And then it clicks in their minds, and they're on their merry little way, walking with Christ. I mean, just as we saw this truth in our early walk when we first came to Christ, some that came your way will see it too. And then, like you did before them, they too will hear the call that Revelation 18, verses 4 and 5 say, which is, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached uh, unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. If we wait for the latter rain to fall in the coming days, or even wait for the translation to come upon us on that great and final day before making the decision to follow Christ into perfection, the perfection that we've been striving on to for years, we may never reach that pinnacle in our faith. We must be actively doing all we can to glorify him right now, just as the prophecy says his Gideon band will do before the rain even falls. I mean, truth is, that is what makes us worthy of that rain in the first place. Deuteronomy 11, verses 13 and 14 says, And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain on your land in his, in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. So as students of prophecy, we know the corn mentioned here, is actually what we call in the West wheat today. And the wheat in prophecy is the chosen people of God. And the wine is the doctrine that we are blessed with when we have obedient hearts. And the oil, of course, is the Holy Spirit that we must keep within our lamps so as to keep the path well lit before us. That's why when you see the, 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 when the, when you see the ten virgins waking up, half of them don't have enough oil. Bottom line. 
Before we can walk with him, with him in the heavenly courts, we have to prove we can do so in the earthly right now. And no, I'm not saying we will become sinless beings right now on this sinful orb. What I'm saying is we will become overcomers in Christ who are worthy to receive the latter rain. Being inside or enticed by Babylon will prevent that rain from falling upon us. It's just that simple. If you're disobedient, then he can't use you. I mean, even a babe in Christ can see how the lost fail to follow Christ in obedience in the churches following after Rome. This is why we left those fallen churches. Some of us have came directly out of Babylon itself, like the Roman Catholic Church. Others came from one of her many thousands of sisters. But the truth be told, we all came out of such places because we saw how Jesus was not welcome in those churches that we stood in. And we also knew that we could not effectively share our faith with anyone, anyone in those churches while still in them. Because in so doing, we would look like hypocrites. And we all know what Jesus said about hypocrites in Matthew 23. I mean, he went on a little bit about that. He used the term about, what, five or six times, talking to the Pharisees? I mean, looking back, I recall many times while in those fallen churches before I really had a grasp on, and even though now I still don't have the entire grasp on the truth, none of us can. We're all looking through glass darkly. But I still remember many times when I was in those churches that people would seem to illustrate a mighty zeal for God when they were gathered for worship on Sunday. The word was open, the hymns were sung, the sermons were put forth, and the church said amen. But the very minute we walked out of those churches, the cigarettes were lit, the foul jokes were spewed, and the gossip was flying from lip to lip. This was confusing to me. I mean, for me, even as a young man, I, I said, what is going on here? I mean, it confused me even when I was a Catholic, and it confused me even more so when I left the Catholic Church. I mean, all denominations illustrated the same confusing spirit. In the church, they all beamed with heavenly light. In the parking lot, it seemed to fade a little bit, especially if you got cut off or somebody pulled out, and, you know, you wanted to pass by real quick. But by the time they got home, it was as if they never went to church, or even that church even existed. And the Lord was simply not welcome in their midst at that point. TVs went flying back on, the foul language was going, and the beers were popped open. In short, it was a time to party hardy. We had six more days before we had to go to church. And I praise the Lord for that graphic education because it showed me, my wife, and I that, that such churches did not have the power of the Lord within them. None of the souls in those churches seemed to understand or even desire to know Jesus at all once they left the church building. It was just like he was, for some people, Jesus was just a swear word. It's only the obedient heart, loving soul, or willing spirit that can hope to remain in the presence of God while in the parking lot or on the drive home or even miles from the gatherings day by day. In other words, we're not to follow Christ sporadically or impulsively or only when it is to our own personal benefit. We must choose to follow him because we love him. In daily life, as well as when gathered with the brethren, we must follow his example. As a flock, lovingly and trusting, you know, follows their shepherd. And yes, this means that we are to follow him even when it's difficult to do so. And especially in the days ahead, we are to follow him, even if it means to suffer for his sake with the words ever present in our hearts that, that Job said in Job 13, 15, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. His perfect example in life practice must be ours, word for word, step by step. And when we do this, we will eventually come to that perfection we seek that emulates his character to such an extent that when his father gazes upon us, he sees his son. And when the seeker of peace looks our way, they see the peace of Jesus and make the eternal decision that allows all those seeds of the past to be watered richly in our Father's grace at that moment. I mean, this isn't a game. I mean, this, this ain't a dream or even a mythological walk we find ourselves in. We are soldiers of Christ who have been enlisted in a holy war that prophecy spoke of many times in the Word as well as in the historic record. All throughout history, even those that hate our Lord know all about the loyalty of His bride. This is why we see all, such a well-focused advance against us in the message we bear. The powers that be are pawns of Satan, and they will do all they can to slow the forward progress of God's people, even if they don't know they're doing it. This is why it's so important to come out of the churches that are under the government's thumb. 
Of course, I'm talking about the 501c3 churches. They've created the image of the beast that George W. Bush gave life to on March 7, 2006, when he wrote it into the law that all the churches under the 501c3 are not only considered government agencies, they now have the ability to lobby law. So again, how effective would God's remnant people be while still in such a church? How can one come to the truth, as we know it, and then choose to remain in the house wherein the lie is taught and still be seen as obedient? That is not the character of Christ. It's the character of his enemy. So as we know, if we die before the Lord comes, the character we stand in now is the same we will present in his kingdom. So it's best to fine-tune that character right now. Revelation 21:27 says, there, is, there shall in no wise enter into anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. That means we must be ready at all times and to walk with Christ. We must ready our hearts even now, even, in the midst of these comparatively small battles that we find ourselves in. Pretty soon you're going to be looking at the business end of a guillotine. Do you think you could handle it now? If not, you need to get on your knees. You need to get in the Word. And I say comparatively small trials, because most of us that study prophecy know all too well what's headed our way. I mean, sadly, we also know what's headed towards those that refuse to follow the Lamb of God. There is a much more terrifying path, if you ask me. I mean, truth is, even the coward would rather stand with the Christians, knowing now that the outcome is far better than the plight of the lost, but still, it's not about the flesh. So if the coward's reasoning is based solely to stand with us on escaping damnation, or, or just the calamities, or even the plagues of revelation, and it, it, then it's not about loving the Lord. He would certainly find himself deceased, uh, deceived and in the midst of hellfire anyway. We don't follow Jesus because we want fire insurance. We follow Jesus because we love him, and he first loved us. You know, this reminds me of a man I knew years ago who was looking at some hard times behind bars. He knew his case would end badly, and... Uh, but he also knew that he had 12 to 18 months of court appearances before the sentence was set. Okay, this is back in the 70s, by the way, because nowadays it could take five or six years before your sentence is set. It's, such, it's so corrupted. It's all about making money. They drag it out as long as they can. So anyway, this guy, he joins the gym, and he bulks up as much as possible, knowing that, that he would need to muscle up to survive in prison, especially the one he was headed to. So, how is it, I ask, how is it possible for the wicked to know when to prepare beforehand? But the people of God always seem to wait till the last minute. You know, until those plagues fall, we're in probation. We know they're coming. We see the signs all around us. The Pope's already making friends with all the evangelicals he can get his hands on so that the, the final prophecy of the you know, the Protestants stretching their hands across the Gulf to meet with Rome, that's already here. That's happened. I'm even starting to get emails from people that used to tell me you're crazy when it came to that, you know, when we were exposing that the seven-year tribulation is a lie and the, and, the, and the secret rapture is a lie. Because they're finally seeing that, yeah, you know, those prophecies, all those seven-year trib preachers are saying are supposed to happen after we get raptured up. How come most of them have already been fulfilled? And we're still here. It lets them realize, hey, our pastors have been lying to us. So since we know what's coming, being loyal to his law now is the wise choice. It is also wise that we get into the word daily and on our knees as often as we can each day. That being said, is it possible to prepare for this holy war with unswerving loyalty when standing in Babylon or one of her many sister churches? Do you really think the Lord will understand if we say, oh, but Lord, my mom, my dad... My little sister, my big brother, my wife, my husband, my co-worker, or my best friend, they're in this apostate church. How can I leave their side at such a time as this? Well, if that poor soul had read their Bible, they would know that Jesus had already answered that question. In Matthew 10, verses 37 to 38, he said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. In other words, he can't, he can't use you. If you don't obey him and do it the way it needs to be given, because hey, you really love your mom, you really love your dad, you really love all those loved ones, then you better get out of those churches. 
Because when you leave, they notice you left. They know that you're a Christian. They know you left for a reason. And it makes them realize they better start thinking about what's going on in their lives, too. Because when you're obedient, the Lord can use you. And being obedient, he uses you to make them realize they're supposed to come out, too. If we are keeping his life of perfect obedience and purity, as well as true self-sacrifice ever before us, can we really claim that he would have no issue with us staying in a church that molests children, sanctions homosexuality, declares Allah God, has created the image of the beast, or one that denies his law by keeping Sunday holy, just to name a few, if the leaders of the church not only refrain from rebuking such Babylonian fruits, but actually declare them okay by God, do we not see they have asked our Lord to leave their churches? Seriously. If Jesus was to physically walk this earth right now, today, would he stay in the Catholic Church? Would he stay in the Baptist Church? The Lutheran Church? Or even the SDA Church, for that matter? Every one of these churches are openly walking with Satan, just as prophecy said they would. Worse yet, each and every member of these churches has admitted before many witnesses that they know their church leaders are in apostasy, yet they still stay in their respective churches just the same. Jeremiah 17, verse 5 says clearly, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. This is why Jesus said what he did in Matthew 24, which is, And, they, and then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax uh, cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Well, let me stop here for a minute. The love of many shall wax cold is already here. So you've got to endure now to the end. Because that's how much closer we are to it. And then he goes on to say, Jesus says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Let me ask you this. Can that gospel be preached to all the world right now? Do we not have satellites? I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to get into the DVDs, the, the cassettes, or, or even the missionaries. We've got satellites that are beaming the gospel message all around the world. And I'm not talking about TBN. That is the false gospel message. you got people like us around ham radios, too, getting us all around the world as well. Jesus goes on to say, When ye therefore shall see the abomination, the desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and whoso readeth, let him understand, which means you better be in your Bible. He's telling you to study prophecy here. That's Jesus speaking. He says, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And of course, that's uh, Matthew 24, verses 10 to 16. Just as they saw the abomination of desolation surrounding the city in 70 A.D., we see the same abomination of desolation surrounding the churches today. Because wasn't Jerusalem considered the, the, the location of the church at that time? They are even making YouTube videos right now declaring the protest of Martin Luther is over. Rome has them surrounded once again, but none so much as we see in the Seventh-day Adventist church. They have fallen so far from grace that they, like the synagogues of old, the, the Lord thy God would rather stand outside the camp to gather his flock to safety. Did he not say that his flock should take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees in Matthew 16, 6? Do we not now see the same corrupted spirit of the Pharisee today in the SDA, Catholic, Baptist, Pentecostal, and Lutheran churches, just to name a few? I mean, how can we claim to be striving out to his perfection when we shall receive the latter rain when even he would not be found in such places of worship, some in our number love to visit. If we study his word with the heartfelt desire to proclaim, Be thou my pattern, are we being honest when we look into such churches or truth? And no, we don't have to literally step into those church buildings to disobey our Lord. You could visit their websites. You can watch their YouTube videos. Or, you, or worse yet, you can tithe to their ministries so as to further their work of confusion. I ask, would Jesus approve of our actions if we were to claim him Lord while at the same time embracing those that hate him and his word? I mean, how can we trust someone to tell us the truth when they themselves declare Jesus a liar when he says to keep the Sabbath holy? 
it's what's the difference between that and letting Satan come in and speak to you about Scripture? Because that's literally what you're doing. I mean, would the latter rain fall on us if we were that way? If we were claiming to be followers and claiming to be in love with Jesus, yet we're going to all these websites or these YouTube videos or even hanging out with the people that used to be members of the church we used to go to? I'm not saying shun them and, uh, you know, and, and treat them hatefully. You're supposed to admonish them as brothers and sisters. We'll get to that in a minute, by the way. You have a duty even there. So would the, rattle, would the latter rain fall on us if we're disobedient to the Lord here? No, not a single drop would, would fall on us. If by the eye of faith we see him and trust him as our Savior, Lord and King, he has promised to not only be with us till the end, but to strengthen us with the heavenly nurtured courage, faith, and wisdom with each forward step toward our reward. Some of us are going through intense trials right now, and there's a good reason for it. We all do, as a matter of fact, myself included. We have many lessons to learn. We're still looking through glasses darkly, and we're obviously not worthy of the latter rain yet. It's sprinkling, yes. Some of us are getting a little wet, but that downpour is real close. And we most assuredly need all. Every, we need to get literally flooded just to stand in the days that are racing towards us right now. Those promises can only be claimed in obedience. That's 100% obedience, by the way. Anything less will cause us to be once again entangled in the web of deceit. We know the prophecies. We know what's happening. We see what's going on all around us. Let them call you legalistic. Let them call you a Jesus freak. Let them call you a fanatic. Who cares? If you're following the word of God, you're not a fanatic, you're not legalistic, and you're not a freak. You're a Christian. Let them, it just, who cares what they think? Second Peter chapter 2, verses 20 to 22 says, For if after... They have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled therein and overcome by going to their YouTube videos or checking out their websites. Because you can more or less put those words right in there because that's, that's what entangled therein means. You're going back. You're backslidden. You're going back to the church you left. Even if it's just to find out what they say about this or say about that, if you know that they are in apostasy, why are you seeking wisdom from them when you have 66 books in your hand? From your God. It says here, going on in Second Peter, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn away or to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. In other words, the pig that was washed to bring him to the show at the, uh, the campgrounds or whatever is now rolling around in the mud slop again. Let me ask you this. If you were in a house you built that was on fire and then somehow found a way to escape it, would you think it wise to run back into that fire because it's the house you loved for years? No, of course not. So why is it so many that escape the clutches of hellfire turn to look back at Lot's wife? or to turn to look back like Lot's wife did. I mean, just as the onlookers of old knew the apostles were with, they were with Jesus because their speech gave them away, our walks must also illustrate a loving king to all those who, that he sends our way. But we can never hope to attain his wise and gentle character while ignoring, ignoring his, his will by entertaining our flesh in the world, and worse yet, inside the churches of his enemy. And yes, Babylon and her sisters are the enemy of God on multiple counts. Worse yet, did you see the video I did a few weeks ago, you know, about the, the, the Pope that invited the largest evangelical church in America to come back to Mother Rome? I mentioned this a few moments ago, but we got some more people that just stopped by. And not long after that, we saw those, that mega church minister in Sweden announcing to the entire congregation that him and his wife have decided to convert to Catholicism. And nobody had a problem with it. Soon, every church but the remnant of her seed will be under the Roman thumb and Satan's rule. And somebody thinks, so many people think, and I was just thinking about this this morning, they can't get away with this, they can't do that. They, everybody knows that the Sunday's, you know, the mark of the beast, or everybody knows that, uh, you know, Catholicism, you know, because they're, they're now, I just got an article the other day where the Protestants are agreeing that Catholic baptism is just as legal as theirs. 
And most people will say, oh, no, no, no. It's, well, most people in our numbers would say, how can they miss that? Well, guess what? They're going with the numbers here. They know our numbers are very, very small now. They know they've got the majority of the world with them on their side. And they know the only one that's going to rebuke them or that can prove them wrong is an extremely small remnant of her seed. And so they figure, hey, we got it tapped. They completely forgot all about Goliath, didn't they? <laughs> or Gideon. They're about to find out the hard way that our God is going to shine in an amazing way now. Still, they're under Rome's thumb, all of them. And James chapter 4, verse 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, is a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So if you go to these websites that are more or less of from you know people that believed the way you did before you came into the church, uh, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're, you're being friends with them again. Even if you're saying, oh, no, I'm not a friend with them, I'm just like, you've got to take into consideration what he's actually saying here. He says, no, you don't. You've got a Bible. Run with that. We still have some time. And so we've got to work with this. I mean, the world is still looking on, and they need to see us as his people. They need to echo that which was said of Peter long ago, which was, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee, in Matthew 26, verse 73. Or how about the Hebrews chapter 13, verses 13 and 14? It says, Let us go therefore, go therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. In other words, let's go with Jesus. They've kicked him out of the camp, so let's go out there with him. You know, they ridiculed him. They, they convicted of him crimes he didn't commit. Let's bear his reproach with him. Because we see they, you know, we're, we, we want to seek the eternal city. That's, I mean... We seek the one to come. When speaking of the 11th hour movement, the 11th hour remnant of God, prophecy stated in Revelation 14, verse 4, these are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God, into the Lamb. Every single one of us within this church have left the other churches because we know what we saw with our very own eyes. Because Psalm 42 verse 1 says, The heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. I mean, seriously, deep crieth unto deep. We had no choice but to leave. They asked our Lord to leave and openly placed him without the camp. And so we, too, must stand without the camp, bearing his reproach. They asked our precious Jesus to leave their pulpits so they can move closer to Rome and their worldwide ecumenical group hugs. So be it. We crave his love. We crave his truth. We crave his promises. And we crave his nearness to us. Being as such, how can we stand with those he purposely stated so often in his word are those we must not yoke with or even touch? Is it not clearly written in his soul-transforming scripture, the following truths? Look at Amos chapter 3, verse 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Well, when you echo the words of someone you know that's in sin from their website or their YouTube video or even their church doctrines, you're walking together with them at that moment. How about 1 Corinthians 15, 33? Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. For those of us who have been in this movement for decades, how many times have we seen that with people we thought were strong in the faith? They walk away. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 17. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. He not only asks you to do it, he, asks, he, he tells you why. Do you really want that hug from me? I mean, do you really want me as Lord and Savior? Well, then just do what I'm asking you here. I mean, it's not hard to understand these passages. But the enemy of souls will move some of us to eventually ignore them because of family or friends or business associations or simply fear of being alone. I mean, prophecy also says some of us will fall off the path to completely join with the world again. Sadly, due to the prophesied shaking upon this church in recent days, 
We have already seen some do just that in the last few years. And some we even considered leaders in the church have left and have gone into open sin, refusing to repent. But it's only because disobedience allows Satan to go from his foothold to a major grasp upon the heart of that soul. And when they leave our number, what do they always do? They attack it, seeking some in our number to join with them because they want to lessen their shame. I mean, after all, we know misery loves company. So even still, let us go, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. I mean, just as the wicked Pharisee kicked our Savior outside the camp 2,000 years ago, forcing his disciples to follow him, even unto Calvary, we must do the same today. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Our king died outside the camp, where thieves, felons, and murderers were executed by that very same abomination of desolation that has taken so many souls to their graves to this day. Our Savior suffered outside the gates of Jerusalem, the city that was called to recognize him as Messiah. Shall it be any different today? The ninth, the ninth hour church has echoed the same hatred, same disgust, and very same zeal of hell as the Pharisees, Pharisees of old did, simply because we want to follow the Lamb whithersoever you go. And what am I talking about? Well, the Seventh-day Adventist church has shown open hatred to us in the exact same way, and all of them do it, actually, but it really saddens my heart when I see the SDAs do it because they had the truth. But they're doing the same thing to us that the Pharisees did to Christ and the apostles, and then anybody that followed them thereafter. Still, because our Lord is within us, we love them still enough to ask them to repent and join us before it's too late. Have we not seen the churches today embrace every doctor of Rome within their walls? These nails of hell still ring out just as loud today as they did 2,000 years ago when they ripped through his flesh so we can gain eternal life. So in closing, the prophecy is clear. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 7. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found, some, found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto him, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, ye shall receive. So do you study prophecy? Do you know what the Lord just said in that passage? Yes, most in the tennis today, near, you know, here, like right now, that are near to him, they heard him loud and clear, and they know exactly what hour it is. They know what he just said. But for the sake of the young in faith, I'm going to explain just a few of the symbols. Just the hours. Early in the morning is the Jewish nation that was first called to go out and share the truth. They refused. So the third hour came. The householder came back, saw them sitting around idle, hired more. That's the New Testament Christians that were first called Christians in Antioch. Those were pastored by the apostles. That's the third hour. The sixth hour, that's the Protestants that came out from Rome under Martin Luther's Holy Spirit-inspired Great Reformation. The ninth hour, that's the Seventh-day Adventist church that proclaimed the three angels' message and identified the man of sin. The eleventh hour, that's us. The seventh-day remnant that preaches present truth, finishes the work, and perfects the walk that will give rise to the Gideon band that sees many souls come to Christ. So do you follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, or do you still cling to those prophecy, uh, to those prophecy clearly defines as Babylon in their hearts? Would you rather follow the man in Rome who has now openly gathered all churches under his banner, including the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We got them on camera declaring him a holy man. We got them on camera stating that Allah is God. We got them on camera stating that homosexuality is okay and homosexual marriage is fine and, and that um, everybody should follow the Pope. They've even had a whole, a whole write-up about him one time in one of their magazines. So, would you rather follow the man in Rome? who everyone can now see is gathering everybody under his, under his banner? Or is it the Lamb of God you seek to follow? If it be the Lamb, let us go forth, therefore, unto him 
without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, no reason to be here now. But we seek the eternal one to come. I'll pray that you are blessed.